Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the fluid seminar. Uh, um, uh, today, who is going to be given by one of our own, uh, Tom Akulana, who is a PhD student in his third year, uh, who is being co-advised by myself, uh, Vincent, and also Bruno Despre from JLL. And he's going to talk about uh, uh, what he's been working on during his PhD. Thank you, Tarane. Hello, everyone. So today I'm going to present you part of my work that I did during uh, these three, almost three years of PhD, which is on adjunct-based optimization of two-dimensional Stefan problems. So first, we're going to try to describe the title. So we focus first on the definition of uh, Stefan problem, which is basically a transport phenomenon that uh, has a solid and liquid phase change that occurs due to either evaporation or chemical reactions. So basically it comes from the interaction of both faith phases that are considered incompressible and the speed of the front is related to the jump in temperature gradient. So there has been increased uh, increase interest in, interest in uh, dendri dendritic solidification, phase transformation in metallic al uh, alloy and also solid fuel combustion. So we have here uh, a whole part of the lab that works also on uh, on freezing and melting fronts. And basically, what we can see here in this, uh, in this uh, picture, which is uh, uh, basically a dendritic ice crystal, an experiment from uh, Fujioka 1978, is uh, the instability that appears where you have basically fin finger-like pattern formation that occurs uh, in the side, side branches. So now a bit on the optimization part. So what we want to do here is we want to uh, optimize the shape of the interface because it, uh, it affects uh, the outcome of uh, many industrial processes. And what we want to try to do is to extract an efficient way to control it, right? So there are two major types of, uh, of uh, optimization pro procedures. Uh, one is uh, the derivative free, where basically you have uh, either surrogate models or a neural network, network. And basically you try uh, for different, uh, different values of your control variable and you see how your cost functional behaves. So this is mainly used in uh, aerodynamics. And we didn't choose this one because it may, uh, it may require, require a lot of uh, function evaluations, right? The function evaluation is basically uh, one uh, simulation from time zero to final time. So we choose to, uh, to use uh, adjunct-based methods where basically you can determine the gradient at a lower cost. So what does it mean to determine the gradient is basically we start from a point here given the, this cost functional and we want to find uh, the, best, uh, the best direction on which the, uh, the value of this cost functional is minimized, right? So to do that, what we do is we control the motion of the interface by using a tracking type cost functional. And the problem we solve is the minimization problem here where we want to minimize this tracking type of cost functional uh, subject to the forward problem, which will be the Stefan problem. So now a bit on the on the code. So we developed uh, a package that is written uh, in Julia. Julia is a high level dynamic uh, scientific language. Uh, we listed here some, uh, some of its uh, characteristics. Basically, it's just in time compilation, uh, at runtime. You have also multiple dispatch where, uh, where uh, basically uh, the function method is chosen uh, upon the type of the arguments. You also have broadcasting. You can apply a function element wise. And what's very interesting also is that it's very easy to parallelize uh, your code, right? So you have different level of uh, parallelism. You have the lower level where you have a uh, vectorization of computation, basically a single input to multiple data. Then you have the shared memory parallelism, multi-threading. You just use uh, simple macros. And then you have the distributed par parallel computing, very much like uh, MPI. We didn't use that, that one yet. We just, uh, we just have some shared memory parallelism, but with uh, with good results uh, regarding the, uh, the scaling. So now uh, I'm going to describe a bit how the talk would be, uh, would be structured. First, we're going to discuss um, the numerical method methods that we use for solving the two-phase Stefan problem and some validation cases. Then we're going to focus on the motion planning, that is the derivation of the continuous adjoint and, uh, and uh, the determination of the optimization procedure that we will use to later solve our optimization cases, where basically we will want to have a certain shape of the interface given the control variable, which will typically be uh, the heat flux at the domain boundary. So now we start with the 
numerical section. So the first, the first uh, thing to, uh, to think about is how do we want to track the, the interface. So there are basically two different uh, methods of doing so. There is the Lagrangian one or front tracking. Uh, this method has already been used to model uh, Stefan problems uh, in uh, Trick Basson's paper uh, some 20 years ago. Uh, but we didn't choose this one because uh, of its uh, more complicated, uh, it's more complicated to derive the adjoint with this type of uh, formulation. So uh, then we have, we have the earlier methods. We have the volume of field method where you uh, linearly uh, reconstruct the interface. Uh, this has already been tried in adjoint-based optimization. Uh, in a paper by uh, Alexander Fickle uh, with mixed results due to some uh, problem with, with uh, discontinuities. And then we have also the level set method. So the level set method, the classical one of uh, Osher and uh, Setian, uh, where basically the interface is implicitly defined as a continuous function. Here you can see an example of a level set function in three dimensions. Basically phi here is a sign distance function. And my interface is the intersection between the, the plane and this 3D function, right? So it's the zero level set of the phi function. Uh, this is the way we define our interface. So this has widely been used uh, for Stefan problems uh, in a uh, classical paper of uh, Shen and uh, Osher, and more recently a uh, paper from Alexandre Limar, uh, Stefan Popine, and Christophe Josserand, where they also use uh, the level set method coupled with uh, uh, embed embedded boundaries uh, method. Uh, and also, this method has been used in the optimization framework, meaning that it has already been tried with adjoint-based uh, adjoint optimization for the Stefan problem in Bernauer and uh, Herzog uh, some 10 years ago, but with very simple cases, right? So they had uh, motion planning, which was a simple uh, planar motion. They had uh, an expanding sphere. So now what we want to try here is we want to try to do something a bit more complicated and uh, in particular, try to add some uh, surface tension effects to our setup. So first we start with uh, some level set definitions. Uh, this is how the uh, sine distance function is defined. Uh, we have uh, the sine distance function that is equal to zero at the interface gamma, and that is either positive or negative on one side or the other, right? So this is what we use to distinguish between the two phases, the liquid phase and the solid phase. Then we have the normal vector that is simply defined as the gradient of the, the sine distance function divided by its Hamiltonian. Uh, this is very convenient to, uh, to, de to derive later the uh, Stefan condition, which we will talk about in the next slide. And uh, the mean curvature is simply the divergence of the, of the normal vector. So with this setup, we can, we can have our um, two-phase Stefan problem. Uh, which is written like this. So first we have the two heat equations in each, each phase, right? So we consider, of course, uh, two incompressible phases with uh, matching densities. So we don't, have, uh, we don't have convection, we just have a simple uh, heat equation here, where cap Ki uh, and Ci are the thermal diffusivities and uh, heat conductivities, heat capacity, sorry. Then we have the level set advection equation, which is written here where basically the level set will move w according to a given function, speed function f, right? Uh, and then we have what happens at the interface, which is in red. So first we have uh, the Dirichlet boundary condition, which we can see here. So we have uh, the temperature that is equal to Tm, a melting temperature, uh, plus the terms that depends on the velocity and the curvature, right? So if we forget about these terms, we have these two terms, we have only the melting temperature. This is called the classical Stefan, uh, pro uh, Stefan condition, Stefan problem, sorry. But if we add the contribution of the, the speed and the curvature, we get what's called the gibbs thompson relation. So this is the one that we use, right? And then on top of that, we have the speed at the interface that depends in the normal jump in gradient of temperature, right? So you can see here the dt1 dn and dt2 dn that governs the speed at which the front uh, evolves. So basically, what, what will happen here is that we will solve the heat equation, we will find the new, uh, the new values for the temperature field on both sides of the, of the level set, we will compute the speed, the speed function, and with the speed function v, we will, s we will advect the level, set, uh, the level set function, right? So note here that v here is not f, right? Because the velocity only is defined at the front, and to be able to advect the level set function, we need to extend it 
uh, in the normal direction, and we will talk about it later. So here, just a quick uh, sketch, right? We have the level set that is negative inside, positive outside, B is equal to zero at the interface. And then at the interface, we have the digital boundary condition uh, as written there in red. And we also have the, um, the Stefan condition, where here we just, uh, we just use lambda, the latent heat of solidification, as equal to one. And we note this, uh, this jump as the, with the brackets to ease the notation. So now, to describe a bit the steps that we use to solve this problem. So we have the heat equation, we have the level set advection equation, and we have two things happening at the interface. So what we do first is we solve the heat equation, meaning that we update the temperature field on both sides. For this, we need, of course, the Dirichlet boundary condition at the interface. Once we have the new, the updated temperature field, we solve, uh, we compute the Stefan condition. We compute V, which is the normal jumping gradient of temperature. Once we have V, we extend it away from the front, right? Meaning that we uh, uh, we solve we solve uh, what's called um, norm normal advection of the velocity away from the from the front, and then we update the level set function. We solve the level set advection equation with uh, the extended velocity field. Once the level set advection level set function is advected, uh, it might lose its uh, property of, of sine distance function, right? And this is very important. Uh, because we need it to, des to accurately describe the normal and the curvature of our, uh, of our front. So we need to reinitialize the level set function. Uh, we'll talk about it later, right? And the last step is to treat the, cle the, the dead and fresh cells, right? Because as you advect through the Cartesian grid, what happens is that basically you can unveil or cover uh, some cells, and you need to be able to initialize the temperature field uh, that wasn't previously there, right? So we start with the first step the temperature update. Uh, so as we said, the temperature, the heat equation is discretized on the both subdomains, uh, omega one and omega two, which are the two phases of our uh, problem using a Cartesian grid. And what we do here is that we use a novel cut cell method. That's what was developed by, uh, by Tarane, Vincent, Lechenadec, Alejandro, and me, where basically we do, we modify the standard center uh, finite difference uh, formulas for approximating the second order derivatives, right? Uh, the interface position uh, is used to compute the areas and volume wetted by each face. Here you can see an example of the interface uh, with the two faces across, across it, right? And once we have this, what we do is we supply it to a margin square algorithm, which is here on the left, where basically we can distinguish uh, 15, uh, 16 different cases, right? Zero being the case of a, let's say, liquid, liquid cell, and 15 being the case of a solid, solid cell. And the other ones are the ones where we have a partial cell, right? And once we get these these cases, right? These cases are are, are uh, computed using uh, using the values at the corner, which are interpolated off the level set function. We can know where the interface crosses the Cartesian grid. Therefore, we can compute the uh, phase capacities and volume fractions that will be used in our modified uh, finite difference uh, formulas. So now a bit on those formulas. So if we consider first just uh, the discrete Laplacian operator in the x direction, we start by, by uh, stating the Stokes theorem here, with Vs being the out outward, uh, outward, outward point pointing surface element. Uh, so we have here, for example, the x component of the gradient in temperature, which is equal to uh, the integral over the surface of the temperature. Uh, times e x with e, which is the normal uh, the normal vector in the x direction uh, with the dot product of the outward pointing pointing surface element. So now we can do we can decompose the contour uh, partial uh, omega here by being the un the union of uh, different uh, subsets, uh, basically s plus s minus s plus, which are uh, which are the direction of the mesh aligned surfaces and the union of the contribution of the boundary here, which is omega intersect intersected with gamma, right? So if we consider, for example, the gradient component uh, half, a half a grid away from, uh, from, the, from the cell center, we have this, uh, this first, uh, this first uh, formula here. We apply the Stokes theorem, and we have a contribution on the fluid, which is the contribution on the, the full cells, and then we have the contribution on the boundary, right? This is the contribution of the boundary, the boundary uh, portion 
of the next cell. So once we have that, we can decompose the right-hand side that we just showed into basically a homogeneous and inhomogeneous uh, contribution. So the homogeneous contribution is just the classical finite difference uh, uh, formula, right? Where a uh, plus three half, a one uh, plus one half are defined here. So you have a plus one half that is this one, and a plus three half that is this one, right? If we consider only that we are in the blue face, so this is the x component of the gradient in the blue face, and then you also have the contribution of the inhomogeneous uh, uh, gradient, which depends on a minus one half, right? and a plus one half and a plus three half, right? And this is times the, uh, the Dirichlet boundary condition that is imposed at the interface here in red. So once we have this gradient, we can apply the divergence operator and just recast it into uh, the Laplacian, the temperature Laplacian. And we obtain this formula here, where basically you have the gradient uh, that is located uh, at plus one half grid away from the, from the cell of interest, minus one half, the same one and the, uh, the other one on the other direction, right? So we have j plus one half, j minus one, minus one half, and that are divided by the staggered volumes v, uh, vi j plus one half or vi mo i minus one half, etc. These staggered volumes are located here with the dotted lines, and these volumes are computed by averaging the volumes of the, of the full cells, right? So this is the way we compute the staggered volumes. So now that we described a bit uh, the discrete version of our Laplacian operator, we can test it on a simple case. Uh, here what we chose to do is we chose to have a stationary geometry. Basically we have a circle in a square, right, where we impose, uh, we impose a Dirichlet boundary condition equal to 1 at the interface. And we only solve, we only solve inside. So we can, we can have um, a convergence plot where we choose, for example, n equals 256, the, uh, the reference solution. And we can see that it converges with a quasi uh, order 2. So here at the top, you can see what the temperature field look like for different uh, values of, uh, of n. Right? In red, it's the interface. And the color map, it's the temperature. So this is, this is all good for stationary, stationary geometry. So now, as we said, once we, have the, once we have the temperature field, what we want to do is we want to compute the Stefan condition. So uh, this Stefan condition depends on the jumping gradient of temperature. We use the johansson colella method to compute it. This method is also used in, uh, in Limar's paper. Uh, basically, we, uh, we pick a point here that is, uh, that is the, the centroid of the interface in the mixed cell. And we shoot a line collinear to the, to the normal. And the intersection with the vertical dotted lines here is interpolated with the three neighboring points. Okay, so we have these these three points are known, and this blue one is is uh, interpolated with a, a quadratic interpolation uh, with the, the three neighboring ones. The same one for the purple one. And once we have those values, we can compute the gradient on this side, right, on the liquid side. We do the same for the solid side, and the difference gives us the jump in normal gradient, right? So we tested it also uh, for a circle where basically we initialize it uh, with a, a given temperature field and we computed the Stefan, the, the velocity at the front, meaning that we, compu we computed the jump in normal uh, gradient of temperature. And we have this, uh, this uh, result of convergence, right? We are close to, uh, to order two. So this is, um, this, this difference be between, between this and the order two might be, uh, might come from the fact that uh, this is very sensitive of uh, the position of this interface, right? Where do you cut the Cartesian, Cartesian grid? And what we do is we assume that this is a, this is a li uh, piecewise linear within the mixed cell. So it might be due to that, but still it looks okay. So once we have the velocity, what we do is we extend it away from the front, right? So we d what we do is we solve this, uh, this modified advection equation uh, in a fictitious time, right? This time here is not the physical time. It's something fictitious. Uh, with the boundary condition at the interface being that f should be equal to v uh, at the front, right? So we use a first order uh, upwind scheme and the forward early method uh, to solve this equation. Here you can see uh, very briefly the, the discretization. 
where delta uh, delta tau is chosen is chosen such that uh, delta tau over h is equal to 0 0.45. So this comes from a, from a paper of Peng et al. Uh, and basically, what we do here is we advect the velocity of the front for a given fictitious time that is related to the width of the narrowband. And this is something that we'll show in the next slide. So basically, you can choose it to uh, to be, um, for example, if you don't advect the velocity field, you just get the velocity at the interface here in red. If you advect it six cells away from the interface, you get this type of velocity. 12 cells, you get this type of velocity, right? So you have the velocity field that is normally advected uh, of the interface. So here, in this example, we chose to, um, to show a crystal that is initialized uh, in, a, in a domain where the temperature is zero everywhere, and we just have one iteration of the heat equation with, um, with the Dirichlet boundary condition equal to uh, epsilon uh, times kappa, right? Kappa being the curvature. And here you can already see that uh, the velocity is positive at the in the kinks, right? And it's negative, uh, sorry, it's positive in the kinks and it's negative at the tips, meaning that the surface tension uh, effect will, will lead this crystal shape towards a circular one, right? If the tip goes backwards and the kinks go, go in this direction, you will tend to uh, regularize the solutions toward, towards uh, uh, a circular shape. And this is the first example of the effect of the surface tension in this problem. So now that we have the extended velocity field, we can safely advect the level set uh, function. So we use um, an implicit explicit kim for the advection of this, uh, uh, this function, right? So we can re recast uh, the level set advection equation in this form, and we can divide it in two conservative and non-conservative terms, A and B, right? And this gives us a second order partial differential equation, which is very much similar to a weighted diffusion equation. So that means that now we have a diffusive type CFL, and basi the basic of this scheme is uh, if A represents a forward, uh, forward uh, diffusion, then we treat it implicitly. If B represents a backward diffusion, then we treat it explicitly, right? So this is the way we distinguish between the explicit and the explicit part. And of course, uh, if it's the opposite, we do the, we do the, the opposite. So here is a, just a, a quick scheme of how, how it looks like. So if we, if we have the outflow from a cell here in blue, we treat, it I we treat it explicitly, and the inflow towards the cell is treated implicitly. Uh, and this is just the way we compute, we compute the normal uh, in, the, in the cell, which is using a diamond cell strategy that comes also from, uh, from Mikula and co-authors. So we can also validate this for different uh, CFL numbers. So here what we chose to do is we chose to uh, test it on a retracting circle. So the initial, initial shape is uh, this, red, uh, this red interface, and we run it with a, a, a speed, a speed uh, that is equal to minus n, so minus 1 times the normal. So the circle will retract in a normal fashion towards this final, uh, final interface, which is in, in white here. Right? The heat map here is the uh, normalized error. Of the of the level set uh, the level set function and we test this for different uh, grid points and different CFL numbers right CFL equals one four and sixteen and here are the are is a summary of the results so the blue lines uh, correspond to the same uh, number of points for different uh, CFL numbers these three blue lines and what we can see is that regardless of the CFL that we choose we have uh, another two convergence of uh, of this scheme uh, so this is very nice because it allows us uh, to relax the classical CFL condition that you might have in uh, explicit schemes. And basically, you can it's because of this that we can do our method that way, right? We can first safely solve the heat equation, we can then have the whatever velocity field we want, because we will always have uh, this implicit ex explicit scheme that will work no matter, no matter the, the CFL number. So, second to last step, once we advect the velocity field, we need to reinitialize it, as we said, because we need to, to retain the sign distance property. Uh, the way to do that is to reinitialize phi by solving the econel equation, which is written here. Basically, what we want to do here is we want to have this uh, Hamiltonian of the level set function that uh, being equal to 1, right? If this is, big, this is equal to 1, then this cancels, and we get, we get a steady state. So 
what we do here is that we solve again this equation in a fictitious time uh, using a second order in you know, a finite difference with a forward Euler uh, time discretization. So there are many, many ways of uh, also of uh, having a different uh, time integrators. Uh, in this paper here of mean uh, of 2000, 2010, uh, there have been some tests, tests that uh, maybe the gauss seidel method was better or uh, ERCA2 uh, should be better also, but here we chose, we chose the simplest one. Uh, and then we can test it on, uh, on the classical one, which is the same test as they had, uh, where basically you initialize a level set function uh, with a perturbation. So the red line, the red interface here is the zero level set. And here you can see the perturbation that, uh, that you impose at the beginning. And as you iterate through the fictitious time, you see that you, you, you recover the sign distance function. Now everything is equally spaced, right? So each line here corresponds to a given level set. And you can see that each line is equally spaced uh, with the within a number. So uh, basically what we do here is we converge towards the zero level set uh, red interface. Okay, so last step of the numerical method. As we said, as we move the interface uh, through the Cartesian grid, what could happen is that basically here, if you consider that we are in the solid phase and the interface is going uh, downwards like this, here we have some full cells, here we have some uh, mixed cells because they have a uh, uh, solid and a liquid phase, and here we have some empty cells, right, with the cross. Let's assume that in the next time step, the interface uh, is located here. Now, the values that we had that we did that didn't exist here uh, in these phases because they were empty in the previous time step need to be initialized. So the way to do that is to locate the centroid of the face within the mixed cell, here uh, this red point. And basically what we do is we uh, linearly extrapolate a bit similarly to the johansen colella method uh, by co first computing this, uh, these two points TB and TA and then projecting it towards the centroid of the, of the mixed cell. So uh, this is the way of doing for a, a fresh cell. Right for the dead cell, for example, if uh, the inter the mixed cell becomes becomes empty, we just set the temperature field to zero. So this this is much uh, much easier. And with that, we conclude the method. And now we will we're going to discuss a bit uh, some validation cases. So first, uh, the classical one is the growing uh, Frank sphere, so-called growing Frank sphere, where basically you have a nice sphere that is ice sphere that is surrounded by uh, an undercooled liquid. And the radius evolves uh, as square root of time, right? So this is the initial temperature field that you impose, uh, with f being a similarity solution of the heat equation, right? So if you are outside of the circle, you have this uh, this temperature distribution, and inside is zero. Uh, and with this condition, you should have uh, the cir the sphere or the circle in 2D that should grow as as square root of time, right? So we tested it for different grid sizes. Uh, so here on the top left, you can see uh, the radius as a function of the time, right? Dimensionless radius as a function of dimensionless time, uh, with the analytical solution being the square root of time, here the black line. Uh, you can see that, of course, as you increase the number of points, uh, you converge towards the analytical solution. So the, the green one is for 32 points per dimension, uh, the blue one 64, and the, the red one 128. Uh, it looks like this, right? If you, if we, if we look at the, the position of the interface at, at given time, uh, at given times, you have the uh, the red one that is the one with the the more points, uh, the blue one and the green one. You can clearly see that the green one uh, is undershooting the actual solution. Uh, here you you have the the initial radius, which is uh, 1.56, and the theoretical one uh, after a time of uh, one, right? That is 2.2. Uh, and uh, the error in radius is also close to uh, close to order two. So now that we have this, we can also try to look at uh, some other effects on uh, our uh, our method, which are mainly uh, the uh, effects on crystal growth because this is really what we're interested in. Uh, mainly the difference, uh, what happens when we increase the resolution and what happens when we increase the surface tension, and this is what we're going to show now. So on the left. You have the effect of the grid refinement um, for a, a crystal growing for a fixed surface tension coefficient. So basically what we do is we initialize this small crystal here at the center and we let it evolve up until a, a given time. 
So initially, it's surrounded by another cooled uh, liquid. And basically, what will happen that is that it will grow uh, uh, with a dendritic-like fashion if you have enough points uh, in your domain, right? So you can clearly see that 50 points is not enough. But as you increase the resolution, you converge towards a certain shape, right? So uh, we, can, we, can, we can safely assume that for a given number of points, we have, uh, we have converged uh, towards the, the actual shape of the crystal. Then the other thing that we can look at is basically the uh, effect of the surface tension. So remember that the surface tension acts uh, in the Dirichlet boundary condition at the front. So here we fix the number of points and we vary the surface tension. And what we can see is that for uh, an increasing surface tension coefficient, you have a regularization of the, uh, of the shape, right? So basically what happens is that the, the, secondary, the secondary tips no longer grow because the surface tension is too, um, is too high. And as it's in competition with the initial undercooling value, it starts taking over and basically you get this very smooth uh, shape. So this is, uh, this is for a constant uh, surface tension coefficient. Now, if we want to model the crystal shapes, uh, we need to use a variable surface tension coefficient where basically the surface tension now depends on a given angle uh, with the mode, right? Where A0 here in this, uh, in this equation represents the prescribed angle of symmetry on which the dendrites will grow. So you can see here on the left that if we initialize this small crystal and we impose the, uh, the angle uh, to be equal to pi over 2, we have this type of shape that appears. But if we change the angle for the same initial position, uh, we see that it starts tending towards the prescribed angle, right? So this clearly shows the, effects, uh, the effect of the surface tension coefficient. So what happens is basically that along those lines, the surface tension is minimal, therefore the tip, the tip uh, velocity is maximal. So now that we have shown a bit um, the methods and validated it, we can start with the motion planning and descent algorithm. So this is the optimization part of this, uh, of this work. So first, we recast our, for our Stefan problem into a forward Stefan, Stefan problem, where we can see what we, what we showed uh, earlier. We have two heat equations, one in each domain. We have an initial, an initial uh, temperature field in the, in the whole domain. We have the control variable that is a Neumann boundary condition on the domain boundary. So this will be the control variable that we want to, uh, want to modify, such that we converge towards, uh, towards uh, the constant point being, uh, being minimal. We have the classical Gibbs-Thompson relation at the interface. And we have the level set advection equation, where here uh, we, just we just wrote that uh, the speed function is directly the jumping gradient of temperature, and of course, the initial value of the level set. So this is the forward problem. And now what we want to do is we want to uh, derive the continuous adjoint problem of this specific one. So in order to do that, <laughs> what we need to do first is to, uh, to state uh, a cost functional, right? So this cost functional J which is of tracking type. So this has a few terms. The first term uh, tracks the temperature field, right? With TTF uh, being the desired temperature field. This one tracks the position of the level set, the position of the interface, with phi TF being the desired position uh, that we want, to, we want to, to aim for. This extra term here uh, corresponds to the length of the interface. This is useful, for example, if you want to kill some instabilities where, of course, the length of the interface will grow as the inter instabilities appear. And th this last term is just uh, the control cost, right? So now the motion planning problem is the following. We want to minimize this function subject to the forward problem that we just showed. So in order to do that, we introduce uh, the adjoint fields. We introduce theta, the adjoint temperature, and, ps and psi, the adjoint level set functions. And uh, we, uh, we, we recast it into a Lagrange functional that is written here, with J being the cost functional that we use. And here is the, the forward Stefan problem times the adjoint fields, right? So what we want to do now is we want to shift the, de the derivatives of uh, the forward uh, fields towards the adjoint fields, right? And this is, th this is done by setting this Lagrange functional equal to 0. Uh, the derivative with respect to t and the derivative with respect to phi. So now we will show uh, some 
quick derivations of the uh, adjunct temperature field, which is far less involved than the, the adjunct uh, level set uh, level set problem, because of course this is this is a problem where the time the the domain of integration moves with respect to time, right? So this omega one and omega two is actually a function of time. So you need you need a few shape calculus tools and transport theorems in order to do that. So if we only look at the temperature contribution here for the Lagrange functional, we have this, uh, these, five, uh, these six terms, right? So we have the first one, which is the contribution of the cost functional, which, was which will give us the initial value of the adjoint uh, temperature field. Then we have the two heat equations here, right? And then we have what happens at the, uh, on the domain boundary, where we had the control variable, and then here is what happens at the interface, right? So we have this theta i, which is just a Lagrange multiplier, and we have the um, the actual ad, um, sorry adjoint um, Stefan condition that starts to appear to appear here, right? So what we do here is that we move uh, both the spatial and temporal derivatives towards the adjoint state. And we do that uh, by integrating by time once using the Reynolds transport theorem, because remember, this is a time moving domain, and twice uh, with respect to space with using classical Green's uh, formula. So now, if we do that, so here we did it once with respect to time and once with respect to space. So what we can see here is we can see that uh, this term doesn't change, right? We have the contributions um, at final time and initial time here for the first Laplace, uh, for the first uh, heat equation. Uh, we have we have uh, changed the dt dt right into dt theta dt. So we moved the derivative with respect to time towards the adjoint state, right? You can see this theta here, uh, and this comes with an extra term, which has the velocity at the front, and this is from the Reynolds transport theorem because once again we have a time moving domain. Uh, then we have the the uh, other term, which is the, the Laplace operator. We can see here that we did it once with respect to time because we changed. Uh, the nabla square into two uh, two nablas here, so we have nabla delta t and nabla theta, right? So we need to do it once more to have the uh, the Laplace operator over the adjoint uh, temperature field. This theta two here is the same, but on the other face, right? And these are the contribution of the interface, wi which we didn't touch yet, and the contribution at the domain boundary, right? So note that this v one and V2 that appear because we use the Reynolds transport theorem, uh, it's actually uh, the velocity of the control volumes at every given time, right? So we have V1 that is uh, V, the front velocity, and V2 that is minus V, uh, the, the front velocity again, right? So later you will see that this term will cancel. So now the last step is to sort this term uh, by the domain of integration. So here we integrated with respect to space one more time, and now you can see that we have the heat equation, but with the adjoint state, with reverse time, of course. We have the same one for the other domain. And then we have the rest. So the rest looks like this. So here we have uh, the initial condition that we will use to initialize the, the adjoint temperature field on both sides. Here, what we have is the boundary condition at the at the at the domain uh, the domain boundary that we will let us see that this will uh, this will uh, simplify towards a homogeneous Neumann boundary condition. And here is what happens at the interface, right? So you can see that we have the theta 1 V, the theta 2 V that we, that we discussed previously. So these terms will cancel because, of course, uh, theta is continu continuous across the interface. So V is equal to V, theta 1 is equal to theta 2 at the interface. So these terms will cancel. Now we have this normal jump in adjoint, adjoint uh, temperature field, which will be the adjoint Stefan condition, uh, with theta i being uh, Lagrange multiplier. And now we have this extra term also, which is actually the, the most interesting one, where we see that we have psi, the adjoint level set function, that enters into the Dirichlet boundary condition that we apply for the adjoint temperature. So that means that now my adjoint level set function will be used to impose a Dirichlet boundary condition in my in at my interface. So if we stop here for the derivations and we just recast the, recast the, adjoint, uh, the adjoint problem, we see the following. So we see the two heat equations with reverse time, right? We see the initial, initial value here, the, the third line for the adjoint uh, temperature field. Uh, we see that 
uh, now my control variable that was actually my Neumann boundary condition is uh, mapped towards a homogeneous Neumann boundary condition. And here we see the Dirichlet boundary condition at the interface, which is actually equal to psi times the Hamiltonian of the, the forward level set, right? So I need, I need this, this uh, psi to be able to solve my heat equations, my heat equation. And what, if, what is uh, psi now? Well, psi is initialized in this way, right? Simply, we have an extra curvature term here because of some uh, shape calculus theorems. And we have the uh, adjoint level set advection equation, which is written here with an extra source term that depends in the uh, jump in adjoint uh, temperature fields, right? So it might look a bit, a bit complicated, but actually it's very much the same as the forward, right? We have two heat equations, one level set advection equation. We have so, uh, some extra steps because we need the source term. Uh, the initialization is also needed here, but it's, it has the, ma the same structure. And then lastly, it's the optimality condition that will be used to update the U control variable as we iterate through our uh, optimization procedure. So now, last, last thing on this, uh, on this section, the optimization algorithm. What we do is we first, uh, we solve the forward problem, right? For T and phi. Once we have this, we can initialize the adjoint problem with the, the final time. So we solve it for uh, theta and psi. Once we solve it, we can update, uh, we can compute the gradient, sorry, which is actually equal to the optimality condition that we just talked about. So uh, this, for example, if we look at the domain boundary, uh, this will be uh, used um, at each point, right? So we will compute the U, uh, the new U at each point, given the theta that comes from the adjoint problem. Then there are some extra steps that are inherent to this LBFGS method, where basically you, you can choose to save or uh, remove some previous iterations to help you get a better uh, descent, right? And what we do here is that we construct uh, the inverse of the Hessian. We have uh, an initial direction, and then we determine uh, the step sigma using a line search uh, where sigma minimizes uh, this, uh, this function here, right? So in this step, in this step, of course, you need to call for the forward problem, right? You need to check. You need to check for different values of u if you are getting if you are getting uh, the right uh, the right step. So that's why, uh, in our results, the number of calls of the adjunct problem are not equal to the number of calls of the forward problem, right? You need one and one, but here in this step, you need uh, you need forward problems uh, solutions, and then you update u and you start again, right? And the convergence is basically a tolerance uh, with, with the desired uh, position of the interface or the desired temperature field. So now the optimization cases. Uh, so we chose to show here three optimization cases. So the first one is a melting circle uh, that we want uh, to melt towards a desired shape with the control variable acting on the whole boundary domain. Uh, as, a second, as a second case, we chose to uh, control the molin sekerka instability. So what is the molin sekerka instability? Uh, it's basically when you perturb a flat interface uh, with a given uh, with a given temperature uh, temperature uh, distribution, you will get some kind of dendritic growth with a finger like uh, pattern. So we will want we, we we would like to see if we can control actually this instability acting on the top boundary condition. So the instability will grow towards the top, and we will try to counteract it by using U at the top boundary condition. And then, uh, as the last case, we will uh, just show the growth of uh, three crystals that we will merge together uh, with anisotropy effects. And basically what we want to do here is we want to see if we can com compete with the uh, prescribed anisotropy effects by acting on the domain boundary again. So basically the, the crystal will grow towards one side and we want them to grow towards the other side. But they are they're, uh, moved towards that side because they have this uh, anisotropy built in with within. right? So in each case, uh, the desired level set function and the desired temperature field are computed in advance. So meaning that we know what is the desired solutions. Um, and also the other, the other uh, important thing is that how do, we, uh, how do we update the control variable u? Well, we discreetly, co we discreetly compute the optimality condition at e each point on the boundary. And then uh, we, fit it toward, we fit it with a given basis, right? Such that the boundary condition is smooth enough. So now the cases. So we have the merging circle, right? We have uh, here in these figures in red the desired shape, uh, in blue the final shape of the given iteration, and in black uh, the position of the interface as we evolve through time. 
So you can see that uh, as we move through our optimization procedure, we converge towards the prescribed shape, right? U acts on the whole domain boundary, meaning that it acts on the four boundaries here. And the basis that we use for U is written, is written here, right? So we cannot choose any basis because, of course, uh, this will strongly influence the way our uh, cost functional is, right? So we want to avoid to have some uh, many local minima so that we, our adjunct method works. So we need something that is simple enough but not trivial. So this is, uh, this is very much uh, something that, that we, just, uh, we just check, right? Uh, here we have the cost functional as a function of the iterations. We can see that it, it converges. Um, the parameters that we use, so if you remember the beta 3 here control the length of the interface, this is set to zero, it has no meaning here in this setup. Uh, we have uh, a surface tension coefficient here that is fixed of 0 0.02, and uh, with this setup we have a 40, 47 uh, forward problem calls, meaning that we solve 47 times uh, the forward problem and 21 times the adjoint problem. Uh, now the other one is the mullin sekarka instability. So basically what we see here is that initially uh, you have this kind of instability growing with a finger-like pattern, right, towards the top. And here we act only on at the top boundary. And what we want to do is we want to impose a heat flux such that we kill, we kill these uh, this growing instabilities. So we want something that, uh, that acts only uh, here on this on these three uh, these three uh, fingers right not here at the in the kings so once again we have we have a convergence here we have a different base basis for you uh, and basically here the only thing that's different is that we now use this beta 3 term that controls the length of the interface because of course uh, if the instability is growing then the length of this blue curve is much larger than this one right so this is something that helps our uh, gradient uh, our uh, optimization procedure towards uh, the minimal cost functional. And then the last case, so we initialize three crystals, right here, one, two, three, uh, in an asymmetric uh, fashion. And uh, we impose, so we impose, uh, we impose uh, an undercooling uh, uh, around these crystals, and we have also an isotropy effects that will lead um, this crystal growing towards the, the corners of the of the domain, right? And we act on the whole boundaries, and we want to to have this final shape, which is no longer uh, the growing towards the corners, but towards the sides, right? So we have this new basis here, which of course is much uh, simpler than the than the last ones because we have less parameters to fit. Uh, this is because this is a much more involved problem, right? If we choose a basis that is too complicated, then you will have a cost functional that is that has too many local minima and you won't be able to uh, to descend properly um, so this is uh, these are the parameters once again the beta 3 is set to zero because the length here has no meaning in our uh, optimization procedure and with that we will conclude this talk so uh, the basic things to to remember is that uh, we implemented a novel uh, cuts and method for moving complex geometries right so this was the cuts and method that we showed uh, in the temperature update uh, part. Uh, we use a high order implicit explicit scheme for the level set advection equation, meaning that we don't have a CFL condition for this, uh, for this equation. Um, we have proven that this adjoint based method works in the context of, of phase change with again complex geometries, not very simple ones of planar motion, etc. Uh, with this given uh, LBSGS uh, optimization procedure and the future work here is very um, uh, is very uh, direct, right? Is try to solve uh, Stokes or Navier Stokes in the liquid phase and try to see if we can recast the adjoint to do the same thing with this e extra uh, set of equations and uh, also compare uh, this optimization with the derivative free one that don't need this adjoint uh, problem, right? With that, I thank you for your attention. <laughs>
this sense, uh, you are not uh, actually optimizing the entire trajectory. You are just optimizing the less yes. states, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm optimizing the, f the final shape. So you can have uh, a more complicated uh, cost functional, for example, uh, uh, this one here. You could have terms um, that are, um, for example, you can integrate uh, over the whole time span, right? Okay. If you if you would integrate it over the whole time span, then you would track the, the trajectory uh, through time. But so that's not what you are using. You are not using this functional in the last moment, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm using this one, yes. This one? Yes, I'm but not tracking. This one is the last moment, right? Yeah. Oh, no, because TF is the final. Yes, one. it's okay. the final, yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Another one then. Yeah. Um, uh, do you, can you do it in 3D? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the 3D extension is very straightforward. <laughs> <laughs> is that how you say it? <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we're trying. We're tr actually, we are. Uh, so we are working with Alejandro now, that just started his uh, PhD on the Cutsen method, and we are trying to do it uh, in 3D, right? Um, um but yes i mean this is the clearly the next step we we would like to try to to solve the stocks or navy stocks in the fluid phase before and uh, but of course now the problem is that this code um so it's an in-house code uh it's very much 2d right it's it's hard to uh, to extend it to 3d so we need to think uh, maybe to go back a bit and rethink a bit the some functions some operators we use but it's uh, yes that's that's clearly the one of the goals here. Okay, thank you. Uh, I would just add something to that: is that I think the bottleneck is just the linear algebra. I think to solve for the uh, when we add to do the solver, and we are hoping that we're going to have a student uh, a postdoc joining us uh, for, for a year to work on how to solve the linear algebra to how to invert the problem problem. Yeah, so hopefully that will take us a little bit faster. So, y so you, you do, you use the adjoint because, you know, it's more efficient in the sense that you don't have to uh, compute as many forward problems as you would if you use something else. But did you have comparisons with, you know, in terms of efficiency? Yes, no, that, that the, you know, the other methods are simpler. Uh, yes. To implement, yeah. but uh, but yes. So do you have an idea on how mm. better this is? Um, this is very much dependent on the um, on the space the on the space of the control variable that you want to optimize, right? If you have only one parameter that you want to uh, to control, then of course it's much easier to do some derivative free optimization, right? For example, if my u was a constant along the domain boundary, then I just use a derivative free and I feed it to him and it finds it in few iterations, but if you have some st something a bit more complex, right? If you want to have something uh, with a lot of uh, different bases, uh, some Fourier modes, etc., then uh, this is very, very, uh, uh, very efficient because uh, you get all the information through only one equation, right? The optimality condition, uh, which is written here. Sorry, yeah, from from this optimality condition, right? So you get all the information you need from here. So you you can discreetly have uh, every point that you want. Uh, y you you can you can uh, you can change them, right? So I think that uh, yes, th this is something that I put in the future work, which is the comparison with the derivative free methods. Uh, but it's clear that uh, the simpler you go, uh, the less efficient it uh, is the, the adjunct. Um, how do you choose your function u? Uh, in the end, you you gave some examples of functions u are defined with only two or four param parameters, like this one. Yeah. Um, for example, here, why d why did you choose this type of function? Why d why did you stop at uh, four parameters and not eight or something else? Or yes. So th this again has to do with um, uh, with the fact that. 
I if you give it too much uh, degree of freedom, if you, if you have too, too many degrees of freedom, uh, you might have something that will never converge. So basically, uh, you, you will be stuck in some local minima because your cost functional would be too, uh, too complex for your gradient-based uh, optimization. Yeah. So this is something that I choose because I know that it works. Right, because I know that uh, if I go one uh, one coefficient uh, uh, up, uh, it might not work. For example. Okay. So so for example, for this one, uh, for this one, having uh, eight coefficients to fit works. Right, because I, I know that it works. But of course, it's this is uh, this is why, for example, for this one, I'm using only two two things to fit, because this is a very mo very uh, very complex problem. Right. So uh, I cannot let it have too much freedom for my control variable because it might uh, it might uh, it might go completely astray right and also you might have some problems with the with actual the actually the domain on itself right you could have uh, something that starts uh, starts uh, things that it starts converging but actually it gives a very wrong um, control uh, neumann boundary condition and uh, the interface goes outside of the domain and then uh, it uh, it breaks your optimization procedure, so you need to have some kind of uh, of box within you try to find the best uh, values of the control. Okay, so it's something that you have done numerically. Yes, but you have not uh, theoretical. No, uh, no, background it's just for it or it's just uh, yeah, trial and error at the end. Any more questions? Well, I think we can thank uh, thank Thomas. Thank you so much.